Hi, welcome to another edition of This Issue. Uh, we're just completing the seventh year of broadcasting this issue uh, here in the uh, Midcoast area. I'm grateful to all the people that work on the crew to help produce the show. And I also want to thank all those of you that watch the show and have come up to me over the years in grocery stores and other places, even the Common Ground Fair, and say that you enjoy uh, the guests that we have on the show. So thanks again for watching. Well, my guests this time are two students from University of Maine in Farmington, Nicole Moreau and Alex Valente. Uh, thank you both for coming to the show. I'm glad to have you. Thanks for having us. We're pretty excited. <laughs> uh, both of you are involved with a group called Paint at University of Maine, Farmington. Tell us about uh, yourself and uh, about what Paint is. All right, Nicole's VP, so I'm going to let her go first. Well, PAINT is a club called Peace Activists in Training, and it is pretty much entirely student-based, and we're just working to raise awareness about the cost of war to other people on campus and in the community. We're working closely with Doug Rowlings of Veterans for Peace. So we're just we're trying to get our message out there. We're working on the Bring Our War Dollars Home campaign right now. So Tell us where you came from. I am from Livermore Falls, Maine. Okay. It's middle of nowhere. <laughs> And Alex, how about you? Um, I am from Wyndham, Maine, and that's around the Portland area. And Paint, we are, we're also working with, um, I'm sorry, did you say Code Pink? Also? No. We're working, working with Code Pink that. and VFP, so it's pretty exciting. So. How did Paint get started? I saw a flyer for it, and my roommate snagged the flyer and was like, this is something you have to go to. And I went to the first meeting, and then I became the treasurer, mm -hmm. and we just took off from there. Uh -huh. And how about you? I actually went to the Amnesty International meeting on campus and Jade, the president, said, I'm starting this club, do you want to help me? And I, of course, said yes and just sort of steamrolled from there. And how long ago did paint uh, get started? September. Oh, so it's Very new. Very new. Uh, why did you both want to get involved in the peace movement in particular? What was it that drew you to that? Um, the peace movement to me, it's just, I've always gone towards peace you know it's been like something that I've wanted to delegate and having this whole movement start I, I was unaware that there was even a movement going on I mean I had limited resources before I came to college and then seeing the fact that I could not only join a club but be the treasurer and be extremely involved in it and it would coordinate with my I'm taking a first year seminar peace studies class and coordinated right with that so I was like this is this is what I'm here for definitely Tell me about the peace studies class that you take. It's incredible. It's taught by Doug Rawlings. He's a VFP member. And it's we, we've been reading, it's kind of like a parallel history of what actually happened compared to what's being written and taught. And it's, it's basically, it's not changed my life, but confirmed a lot of thoughts that I had about the peace movement and about what has been going on and the actions that people are involved with. So it's really... It's motivated me to just start acting instead of trying to fit some type of mold that we've created. I'm doing what feels right, and it's what the people in this book did, so I know that there's like credibility to it. Is any, so. an, any one particular story or any one particular thing that you've learned in that class stand out in your mind? Um, I really liked Helen Prejean's story. It was um, an excerpt from Dead Man Walking, which is um, it's about capital punishment, and it's when she would, she would, um, she was the spiritual advisor for a lot of the people on death row and just seeing that much compassion and there's a book called Compassion by Christina Feldman we're also reading. So the way that story coordinated with that book, it's just like a really deep understanding and I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, that's great. Uh, you were both heavily involved in the recent Veterans for Peace uh, Peace Walk that started in Farmington on election night and then uh, went uh, more than 126 miles all the way to Portland. In fact, Alex, you were on the walk the entire way. Yeah. And Nicole, you were frequently on the walk. Yeah. Uh, but th in the beginning, the first night, uh, there was a potluck supper in Farmington at a church, and more than 100 people turned out to kind of send the walk off. And more than 50 of those people were students that I assume that you all really helped to organize to come that night. We were all very impressed 
by the great number of students that were there. What, what was it that uh, attracted all those students to, to coming, uh, not only to the potluck, but then many of them came and walked that first day, about 14 miles, in fact, a lot of people walked that first day. Nicole, what do you... Uh... As much as I would like to say that it's because they're interested in the peace movement, I feel like a lot of it, honestly, was due to the fact that there was free food there. And then once they got there and saw what we were doing, and how passionate everyone that was going on the walk was. They felt more empowered to join us on the walk and to become more active in campus. I know that while I've been tabling for paint, people that I saw at the potluck dinner have come up and signed our postcard or taken some of our literature that we have and just have, I feel like more people have gotten active on campus due to the potluck, which is awesome. And if we can start that with food, that's a great way to start it. <laughs> it's a social uh... yeah. Uh, thing. What about the, what have you heard from people that walked that that first day? The, the students. What kind of things did they say about that experience? Well, I know there's a girl in my art class who um, who talked who walked the first day, and she talked with me after it, and she was like, "Wow, I wish I could have done the whole thing. Like, I didn't know it would be that like empowering." And I I was just like, "Yeah, I know, isn't it incredible?" Like, and it was just awesome to have that type of connection and I actually saw her at the library a few days ago and we were able to discuss like just like have a conversation so I think it opened up a lot of doorways for anyone who was on the walk I know that everyone on the walk I I personally respect every single person that was there and it's I learned a lot from them and just that community feel it's it's nice to know that it's affecting other people too so let's talk more about your experience on the walk uh, walk. I again, always get like again. You went the, the whole walk. the whole distance. It was mm -hmm. basically nine days. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, now that you look back on the experience, yeah. what do you, what do you remember? Um, I remember all of it actually. Like I I remember the whole thing because it it was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had, and all I had to do was walk. You know, and that's it's crazy to me. And meeting all the different people and the Nipponjin Mihoji. Um, monks from the Peace Pagoda is just mixing all those different cultures and seeing how much we can all just have fun with each other and all come around this common theme of just basically compassion and love and peace. It's, it's incredible that it had so much power and people think peace to be more of like not as strong a movement as war and all this whatnot, but it's, it's far stronger because it takes a lot more understanding to be a part of it and it definitely, it just, it was like the first, it was like a christening for what I'm going to do in the future. You know, it's like the first ever walk and it just w makes me want to keep walking like every single day. I'm like, why aren't I on the road with this group of people that's so incredible and they're, it's such an easy thing to understand, you know, like let's not harm one another. It's so easy to understand and once you feel it, you understand that it's possible and that's what I gained from the walk. The monks that you were talking about were the yeah. Buddhist monks and nuns. Uh, from an order that does peace walks all over the world. That's really yeah. all they do. Uh, Nicole, how about your experience? What do you remember and what did you really take away from the walk? The walk was just an amazing experience and I know I will probably never forget it. But just, I remember just everybody coming together. Like the last night, just sitting at the table making paper cranes with Mary Beth and my friend TJ and some of the other monks and nuns. Just showing that even after we walked all of this distance, we can still have fun with each other and just hang out and do normal things in spite of the terrible reasons that we're walking because of the war, because of war spending. And I thought it was phenomenal that, I mean, you'd think you'd be tired after all that walking, but something about it is so empowering that it doesn't tire you out, it almost motivates you to keep walking. I found that um, the one day where I ended up going to the hospital, I found that I was more tired that day than I was when I actually walked. And it's just, it's incredible. And when you're done walking, you're like, well, we can hang out with each other or we could walk more, we'll walk tomorrow, you know? <laughs> it's just, it and what so did great. you think, how did you think the public, you know, we saw a lot of people uh, as we walked along the way, cars going by and uh, now and then we, uh, during breaks, we would talk to people in the communities that we walked through and in the evenings at the suppers, we met people from the communities that would feed us and take us home. Uh, what, what was your sense of the general public's response to the walk? Uh, did you have any uh, kind of feelings about that? Um, the lady who who um, ended up pulling over and 
she emailed you, the one that you spoke about. She um, was feeling sad about the recent campaigns and whatnot, and she... The election. Right, right. And she told us that she felt empowered by seeing us, and she was like, was it okay if I honked? Like, that was one lady. And then there was another lady who said almost an identical thing about the, about the elections again. And so to see that parallelism, it's like they're all thinking the same thing and they all want that spark of hope. And the fact that we could give that to them, that was, that was incredible. And I think that if we just keep going, we could really, really start to see a difference. Yeah, the day that we were walking to Camden, I was walking, handing out the green flyers, and these two little boys came running out of their house, and they wanted to know what we were doing. So I gave them some of the information, and they wanted to walk with us. And they ran back to their house to ask their parents if they could, and their parents told them no, which is kind of understandable. I mean, I wouldn't want my small child joining a peace walk with people that I didn't know. But I was just so empowered that even they were curious about what we were doing and that they wanted to join us. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts about it? Wow. <laughs> um, it's really hard to put it into words. That's, that's my gist. It's hard to tell someone about the experience you had. If they were to get up and go out and have it, then they'd be like, oh, I understand what she meant, because it really is life-changing, and it's a great, great peace movement. So what was the message for those that uh, are watching but really didn't maybe read any of the articles about the walk or didn't hear much about it. What was the message of the walk? What was the purpose of the walk? It was to promote awareness about the costs of war, both um, financially and um, mentally, and what it's costing us with our, with our um, veterans returning and veterans care. We need to promote this huge sum of money that we're spending on basically a death trap to convert it to sustainable life. Do you remember how much uh, we're spending every month in Afghanistan today? Well, I know. This it was is a test. A huge <laughs> amount. <laughs> it's like eight million a month. Yeah. A eight billion. billion. Eight billion. Eight billion. Yeah, I know billion. it nauseates me yeah. every time I hear it. And <laughs> that, that billion um, that I read on the back of a Snapple cap with one billion dollars takes a hundred and seven hundred one billion dollars. It takes 2,749 years to spend if you spend $1,000 a day. So that was the one that really made me like, wow, $8 it's a lot billion of money. a month? It's a lot of money. Why are we closing schools? You know, like, yeah. let's get out and walk. Let's talk to people about this. Well, as we were coming here to the studio, we were just talking about this question of uh, your, your school. And that you were, I think it was you that said that you know some people that are not going to school this semester because the, tu yeah. uh, the tuition rising. Would you uh, tell um, that story? A lot, of, a lot of people my age either won't even look at school because of the amount that it's costing them, or they'll, like Nicole said, go for a semester and then have to stop and save up. And it's just, it's ridiculous to me, any type of system that will just put education lower than war costs and the cost of basically <laughs> trying to take over the world and we're not even regulating the education throughout our people before we just go try to take, 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 take. We're taking away from our people too. And education is extremely important. And there's a lot of problems with education anyways, you know, like motivation, the fact that it financially, it's becoming harder. It's that's just wrong. Like It's going to keep so many people from being able to learn when they want to because of money. And we're, just, we're not going to be prepared for the future if we don't have a solid education. What do you think, Nicole? I, just, I know a lot of my friends, just like people I met freshman year that I found out weren't coming back for our sophomore year because they had to spend time working. And they still haven't managed to come back from school. Be I mean, come back because once you stop going, it's hard to motivate yourself to go back to school. How much has tuition been increasing in the last year or so? Um, it was 16,000 like my freshman year and it's been slowly going up and it's just, it's awful. Like it costs more for a in-state student to live and eat on campus than it does for classes, mm -hmm. which is, I just think is completely ridiculous. It's one of the huge things I know that Personally, I'm looking to transfer back to my hometown next year 
because room and board is so expensive and I don't see how it balances out in reality. It just it's something that shouldn't be happening. You shouldn't have to sacrifice school for money and I mean all these people who are going to be working the rest of their lives are going to be working lower paying jobs because they're not going to be able to fill certain positions because of education. So we're kind of setting it up for some really scary future times if we don't get our priorities straight now. Nicole, you also said that uh, to, uh, financial aid is declining. Tell me more about that. Yeah, just I know lots of people that had grants and loans that they're no longer getting because the university doesn't have the money to give out grants or and then the school isn't giving out as many subsidized loans as they used to, so people have to go elsewhere to get loans that they have to work on paying back while they're still in school. So they're working a job to pay for school and to pay back their loans. And loans are getting harder to get also, so. Yeah, they don't want to give them to you without right, a cosigner. Even, right, and it's just, it's becoming this huge entanglement where the result is people are not going to school and that I don't see how that's beneficial to anyone at all. And so increasingly your group, Paint, a peace activist in training at the Humane Farmington, uh, your group is trying to merge these issues, correct? You're trying to talk to the community and to other students about the link between endless war and the cutbacks in education and other things as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, what kind of response are you getting from students uh, as you begin to make these connections? A lot of people are really surprised and a lot of people don't believe me yep. when I tell them this. And then, What like, do you mean when you tell them what? I'm like 54% of our spending goes to the war, like according to this handout that we have like the pie chart that Lisa gave us. I'm like even that's outdated and we're up even more and they think I'm, yeah. uh, they think I'm full of it and I'm like, like no, this is what the government doesn't want to tell you. I'm right. like, this 54 cents out of every federal tax dollar goes to the military yeah, yeah, just, to pay for current wars and people past, past our wars. age that they don't like I know that I've said the statistic forty eight thousand dollars is being spent every minute at the war and they're like that there's no way that's happening and I'm like look into it look it up and I know with this huge WikiLeaks release I've been reading nonstop and people are they're intrigued by that and then not only that but since I got back from the walk I know I've been about about the walk and about everything I've learned and they're just like wow no that can't be true and I'm like no it really is though like this is what's happening what what are you gonna do like why is it that so many people your age don't know these things because there I feel as though perhaps information from their parents it wasn't exposed to them and I don't know many people who watch the news I just I don't know many people my age who do and the fact that they're hidden from it and now that it's starting to shed some light because we're getting older they don't want to see that light because they can get protected by their parents who are going into credit card debt and all these different situations because their parents can handle the problems that's basically the mentality of our our generation they don't need to worry about it because life is frivolous life is fun and they don't think about any repercussions, especially political. They're thinking about all these social aspects. I mean, there's so much that could be utilized from networks such as Facebook, and you'll find people on them for four hours just thinking about everything else. And the issues are getting all misconstrued, and priorities aren't in order. Nicole, you want to add something to that? Yeah, I've had people defriend me on Facebook because I post so many news links and updates about what's going on politically and they just they don't want to see that and yeah. I'm just like I just tell them that they should be happy that I'm posting it because they're not getting that information anywhere else. Why do you else. think they don't want to see it? Why do you uh, say that? I think it scares them mm -hmm. and that they don't want to deal with the problems that they just think if they shove it shove it away somewhere car, car, compartmentalize it it just it won't be a problem for them in the future and reality we're just digging ourselves deeper into a hole and it's something we're going to have to deal with and the sooner the better what do you both study and what's your uh, major in at um, farmington mine is business psychology with a minor in anthropology so. and i am a sociology major mm -hmm. just study the war systems of inequality <laughs> all the warm and fuzzy stuff like that capitalism and poverty and a lot of people 
I just feel like they they act like ostriches, you know? They stick their head in the sand. They can't see what's going on. It's not happening. And that's, we need to break out of that also. And there's just a lot of things that need to be, again, the word, same word, prioritized. It's, it's a problem. And we need to utilize what's out there to promote something before we don't have a, we, we have a strong chance to change something before it goes down, you know, before it happens, we can change it. It's just this apathetic attitude towards it. It's not promoting change. It's, it's actually increasing the rate at which we're plummeting. So it's just, it's pretty insane. Well, it's really great that you're both on the case and your group <laughs> paint peace activists and training at UMaine Farmington. Uh, what are you, what are the next steps for your, for your peace group there on campus? What it, what are you working on now? We're actually working on passing the Bring Our War Dollars Home resolution for the town of Farmington. Alex and I are heading this up. We're gonna we're starting to work on it now, and we're gonna hit the ground running with it when we get back from Christmas break in January, because we don't want to leave the project halfway through, like start it and then leave for a month and not be there to answer questions or hand out leaflets and stuff like that. But we're so. What's the idea? Uh, what what do you plan to generally do? We have a, we're going to have a petition for people to sign, and then we're going to bring that to the town meeting and be like, all of these full-time residents of Farmington want to funnel our tax dollars somewhere else and not towards war spending. Mm -hmm. And we also want to promote um, the awareness, not only verbally anymore, but visually. So we're going to make those um, little leaflets to hand out that have these drastic facts, you know, and try to hand them out at our table time to get the students not only to hear it, but see it, you know, and then gradually try to break in what we can do instead of just overwhelming them with a bunch of problems. Hey, here's our solution for this one. And this is our other solution. And I have this theory that if we take all the existing problems and instead of manifesting in some type of social problem or anything that can distract, we take the problems that exist and work on fixing those and finding solutions. We have one less problem instead of creating all these, he said, she said type of problems that don't matter at all that people need to realize this is not the way people are supposed to live. There are, there's things we can do. Let's start doing it. Let's be bigger than, what, what was it? It was this type of idea that someone's bigger, like you have to have a holy, like a holy stance to make a difference. And that's by Paul Loeb. I'm sorry, That's I can't right. remember it. <laughs> um, but I like your thinking, though, so stay on that, because it's you, you're heading in the right direction. Speaking of visuals, you, you both have a sign you want to uh, show uh, that you've made. Um, hold them up so the camera can look at them. These are, uh, what did you make this for? The for vigil. the vigil tomorrow. I said that we're vigiling on two of my favorite things, sustainability and peace. <laughs> The vigil that you're talking about is the uh, ad Advent uh, vigil at Bath Ironworks, where activists every year during the uh, weeks of Advent uh, hold a vigil at Bath Ironworks and call for the conversion of Bath Ironworks to build rail systems and wind turbines and things like that. So it'll be great to have you out there with us tomorrow. Yeah, we're pretty excited. <laughs> Well, we have, we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, uh, five minutes left. All right. Uh, uh, any other things on your mind here that you might uh, want to um, share with, the, with well, the folks? We did bring two activists to campus. Um, we brought Lisa Savage from Code Pink and... Um, Will Hopkins from the New Hampshire New Hampshire Peace, Peace Action. Action, Iraq Vets Against the War, and Veterans for Peace. So he's a veteran, and yes. just mm -hmm. back from recently back from the wars. What kind of things did they talk about? This was on, on <laughs> this was on the campus. So, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us what they said. Lisa just talked about the Bring Our War Dollars Home campaign, and she gave us some great ideas for how to get our resolution started. And then Will just talked about his story about how he went from going to UMF to joining the National Guard to becoming a peace activist. And he's the executive director of Peace Action New Hampshire now. So he gets paid to be an activist, which is awesome, I think. Where was he stationed, in Iraq or Afghanistan? He was in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. What did, what did he say about the war? He, he talked about how the type of warfare that we're even fighting now 
isn't effective because just for every person that we kill, there's just makes 10 more people that don't like us and how we're just being how we need a new we yeah. need a new system to try to break this. It's not working. It's not we're not delegating anything. We're I can't tell who's terrorizing whom now, you know, watching documents from WikiLeaks and collateral murder. It's just it's gotten to a point where there needs to be a pause or a stop button and before we can even think about reverse you need to we need to promote a lot of awareness and action into what's happening now to make it stop and then figure out what we can do from there so and just think of all the money that's wasted as we're forging ahead into this darkness and right they think like people in this this economy are just keep working harder and harder and they need to just step back and see where our money's going and make that decision, that constitutional right to try to run this country. You know, we the people need to stand together and try to promote a change, a real change. But you know, some people listening, you know, they're working hard, they're trying to keep up and they're sliding down the hill. And uh, they would say to you, everything you say is great, but the government doesn't listen, the politicians don't listen, so I'm giving up, you know. Uh, what well, would, Henry, what would you David say Thoreau to them? and I would put up a huge argument, mm -hmm. and it's it's our civil disobedience. If if anyone reads Henry David Thoreau's essay of civil disobedience, it's if we don't like our government that we're empowering and we're paying, it's our uh, it's our chance to just responsibility. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Our responsibility to change that and to step up and to be the voice. And like our silence isn't protecting us anymore. It's just. It's easier to push around people who would just go with it. And I hear a lot, a lot of complaints about money and what, what we could be getting. And we just need to make that voice heard. Instead of just a complaint, it needs to be put into a positive resolution that we can create. About, if you give up, you're just How about submitting. you, Nicole? What would you say to that same question? I just, we need to work together. I think that's the strongest thing. We need to stop being Democrats. We need to stop being Republicans. We all need to work on the issues that affect everybody and just band together and create social change. It's social change starts small and it snowballs and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually good stuff happens. Yeah, like the abominable snowman, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you guys are really something. You're really wonderful. We have one minute left. Any last final quick thoughts? Thank you very much for having us. Oh, well, it's thank you. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you both. And please keep up your work and call on us all anytime that we can help. Because as you say, we're all in this together. We have to work together, right? And so, you know, oftentimes in our culture, younger people are separated from older people. And it works very well for the power structure to keep us separated from each other, okay. black from white, you know, and on down the line. And we have to break those barriers down and find ways to, to be together and work together more and more all the time. Well, and thank you for watching another edition of this issue. Until next time, good luck to you all, and please get organized. <laughs>